sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we want to close out by saying, how does the Holy Spirit help us? Okay? So. The first way the Holy Spirit helps us is the Holy Spirit prays for us. The Holy Spirit prays for us. All right? Somebody read Romans 8, 26 to 27. Should be in your notes. One of the ways the Holy Spirit helps us is that it makes intercession on our behalf. It can take what you don't understand and relate it on your behalf. Okay. And so that's why we should never be afraid to share whatever's on our heart with God. I like the fact I can be honest with you, even when my thinking is twisted. And, and even when I don't know exactly the words to say or the thoughts to have, if I will just go to him, yep. the Holy Spirit will play the role of interceding on my behalf. If I can't even do anything but get groans up, the Holy Spirit can take the groans and make them known. And then in that, God can shape, reshape my desires to become in more in line with his desires. And that's the role that the Holy Spirit plays for every believer. Secondly, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. 1 John 3, 20 says, For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. There is no reason for us not to know what sin is. We have one another. We have the Word of God. And we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does the convicting and the convincing. Now, that's why we're charged and commanded not to grieve him and not to quench him. And the only reason you would quench him or grieve him is because you don't want to line up with the conviction. You don't want to change what he's convicting you of. And so we allow ourselves to easily be distracted. Okay. And we just outright rebel. Or we do polite, delayed obedience. We're going to fast on it, going to pray about it. No, 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 no. You don't pray and fast on stuff that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of. That's clearly seen in the Word of God. You repent. Change. Okay. And we all struggle with that. <coughs> but we don't have to struggle with it. That's a key thing. We choose to struggle when we don't have to. Because we don't respond to the convicting, convincing work of the Holy Spirit. But He will always do His role as long as you don't grieve Him and quench Him. And you can do it to the point, the Bible says, to where your conscience can become seared. You know, some fraternities, sororities, fraternities probably not sororities, but they brand, they put brands on. I don't know why we do that. We didn't like it when we was in Africa, but we somehow we do it to each other now. But a whole nother topic. But you brand that that skin becomes desensitized. It no longer feels. Because it's become seared. But we can do that to our conscience. And so when you do that, you read the word of God and you're trying to figure out why am I not getting anything out of it because your conscience has become seared. Why am I not no longer hearing the voice of God through the scriptures? Because your conscience may be seared. Yes. Is there a recovery from that? The, only, the answer for recovery for all sins is confession and repentance. But your confession must be real and your repentance must be real. And we don't really understand repentance, biblically speaking. Okay. And
And John MacArthur is doing a great series on that right now, by the way. Uh, on OnePlace.com on repentance. We don't, we don't understand repentance. And for a long time, the church has not understood repentance. Yeah. Repentance is not only a change of mind. It's not only a change of how you see Jesus. It's a change of direction. It's a change of attitude, behavior. It's a change of attitude, uh, actions, and activities. And that began at the point of salvation. And you continue that in sanctification. Until you get to glorification and you want to repent again. But we don't really repent. We feel bad. We feel guilty, but we don't repent. There's no brokenness. There's no godly sorrow. And only godly sorrow, the Bible says, leads to and repentance is just something that's not emphasized or very misunderstood in the church today. So I need to do a series on repentance one day. But go listen to John. He'll, he'll hook you up. You'll repent by the time he gets done. <laughs> Maybe. The Holy Spirit, he gives you a lot of historical background, too. That's very helpful. Because this is not a modern-day problem. It's been a problem in the church for some time. Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact, he talks about... Um, there are people in evangelicalism and Christianism who believe that you discredit the gospel if you present any aspect about repentance in your gospel presentation. You discredit the gospel because now you make it a works that someone has to do. When what, what repentance really is is an outworking of God work of the work that God does on the person. So it's not really even an action they do. It's an outworking of what God has done in them and to them. But they teach that repentance should not be preached or taught in gospel presentations because now you're adding works to faith. They're wrong, but that's what they do. And it's been a history where this has been a historical issue. I don't want to preach a sermon, go listen to it. The Holy Spirit bears witness to us. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit bears witness to us. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Be careful about talking to yourself that you're something that you may not be. Does the Holy Spirit bear witness that you are that? And let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit. He's always going to use scripture to validate the witness. When Paul says, tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith, you got to examine yourself by a certain standard. Because your introspection, as we've already learned, might be twisted. But I looked inside myself, I didn't see anything. I thought I was cool. Well, what about the standard? Did you evaluate yourself, evaluate yourself? Are you evaluating yourself how the Holy Spirit is going to evaluate you according to the word of God? Not to how you feel about yourself. Because we are good at lying to ourselves. There has to be a standard. The word of God is the standard. And so the Holy Spirit bears witness to us that we are children of God. And there are many people who are confessing that they're children of God who are not really children of God, but have talked themselves in or allowed somebody else to talk themselves into it. And it's really not true because they don't use the standard of the word. There's, there's, there's no fruit. There's no evidence. There's no confession. There's no repentance. There's no brokenness. There's no godly sorrow. There's tears. They may even get up out the seats at the great crusade and come down the aisle. But they bear no fruit of repentance. They go right back to the lifestyle they were living before they came down the aisle. They still are controlled by a worldview that's not biblical when they go back up the aisle. Where was the turning? Yeah, but I love Jesus now. I believe in Jesus. 
the demons believe and they shudder, the Bible said. You believe and ain't no shudder. Because when you really know him, you shudder. When you see him high and lifted up, you're like Isaiah, woe is me, I'm a man of what? Unclean, you shudder. We go back skipping to our seats. I love Jesus, he loves me. Kumbaya, how to do he? Where's the broken? Where's the godly sorrow? Where does the change begin? Well, I see Jesus differently now. What does that mean? I like Jesus now. What, what does that mean? I have a great respect for Jesus because of what he went through. That won't save you. All these things, they have nothing to do with Scripture. So is that like is that lack of sorrow is that like a human choice or is that more so like um, like along the lines of like waiting for the seed to to grow I guess in the sense of like um, do, do you get what I'm kind of getting at? Mm -hmm. like, uh, there there will be a continuation of that godly sorrow all throughout your life. But when we're talking about the point of salvation, there is a godly sorrow that should be there that leads to confession and repentance that happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. When they realized that they were guilty of what Peter said, the godly sorrow response was, what must we do? They were cut to the heart. And the sinner asked, what must we do? Peter didn't say, pray this prayer after me. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts, you know you need to do something. What must we do? We're guilty. I'm convicted. What you said about us is true. They were cut to the heart. That's inward conviction. Outward expression was, what must we do? Because we got to do something. We just can't stay this. But Peter didn't say, okay, here's what you need to do. Say these words after me. And if you say these words after me, welcome to the family of God. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible, anywhere. John the Baptist told him, you got to what? Repent. And John does a great job of taking you from the Old Testament to the whole New Testament. He takes you to the whole New Testament, showing you repent, repent, repent. It was the message of Jesus. It was the message of John the Baptist. It was the message of the disciples. It was the message of the apostles. It was the message of the church. But it's not the message of the church today. So people don't repent. They, they jump on the road carrying all their luggage that they want to keep. They come through the door carrying all the luggage of sin that they want to keep. When you really got to leave the luggage outside the door. That's evidence that you have repented. And that's all the work of God. But if God is working, then it's evident in our response. You don't conjure that up, but we can tell God has done something because there's evidence that backs it up. Okay. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true, it is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. See, this was one of Paul's problem with the church correct. If you are my spiritual children, 
how you listen to somebody else when they don't have the same spirit. They don't have the same calling. They have not been chosen by God. They have not been sent by God. But you entertain them. My, his fear, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that we read, you will give them attention. You will turn them off. And you will watch them and listen to them. You say, you know what? They said some good stuff. That sounds right. You know, there's some truth to that. I'll ignore the cyanide, but I'll drink the Kool-Aid. Like you can separate the Kool-Aid once the cyanide is in the Kool-Aid. Yes. Makes me think of just podcasts. Hmm? Everybody, everybody got a podcast. Everybody got a podcast. Everybody got a podcast. Human wisdom or divine revelation? Right. It's, everybody's got a podcast. Yeah. Well, you know, you don't have to go to the seminary. Like the doctor agree don't prove nothing. The Lord speaks to everybody. Well, is there a way to check whether the Lord is speaking to you or not? <laughs> you don't have to go to the seminary. You don't have to have a doctor degree. It helps. But it's not the final approval of anything. But you got to be saying what God has already said and meaning what God has already means. You know, I had an ex-student call me today, just today. And uh, he was taking classes at Midwestern. He was doing a New Testament class. And uh, he, he was uh, struggling with uh, the presentation. And I don't want to get too deep into this. Uh, the, the, the differences between the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, and the Q question. Don't ask me what it is. Take too long to explain it to you. Uh, but it's all about how uh, the scriptures came about. And the Q question basically deals with the fact that um, it dismisses the supernatural divine revelation and basically focuses on the fact that these men passed down oral traditions and then the oral traditions got written down. So it, dis it dismisses the supernatural. He was saying, Pastor Clay, Dr. Clay, I'm struggling with this. You got to help me out. And it was the, uh, the dictionary on, of Gospels of Jesus that he was reading out of, so I have it on my shelf, so I pulled it out. I knew what he was talking about, but I know why he's confused. Uh, but I had to break it down for him. I said, really, you got to stick with what you believe by divine revelation. These are just eggheads who are writing stuff from a different point of view. But you got to learn to know how to be a critical thinker. Critical thinker. Yeah, you gotta learn how to you gotta understand our argument and then use the Bible to defeat it. You just can't say they're wrong and not be able to show why they're wrong. You gotta be able to show and prove why they're wrong. Oh, we all just saying whatever we want to say. And then you're calling me and people calling me trying to figure out what's right. If you believe that the Bible says the scriptures are inspired by God, God is the source, anything they're coming up with that says man is the source, is a lie. I don't care how many PPHD, DDs, and FFs they got behind their name. But you gotta be, you just can't say, I don't agree with that. You gotta be able to defend why you don't agree with that. That's part of critical thinking. And a lot of the, some of the books that I have that, that would bore you all to death are present each argument that people give on a subject. And so I read through all the arguments to figure out how they're coming up with what they're coming up with. And then I go to the scriptures and I debunk what they're saying. But I can't just say they're wrong and not be able to show why they're wrong. That's how we all got fooled by the pandemic stuff. I'm sorry. It wasn't as bad as y'all they tried to tell us. Masks did not work as effectively as they said they worked. 
some of those people were lying. Now, at first, we didn't know. But we can't stay on stupid the whole time. Amen. You need to do some research to find out if what they're telling you is true. Did people die? Absolutely. But most of the people who died had previous conditions. So if you didn't have pretty conditions, your chances went way down. So did those people really die from COVID or did they die by something that was pre-existing? Pre and I can flip statistics. This is the thing you learn about statistics when you take the statistics. My Matthew, you can make statistics say whatever you want to say. You, you can make statistics say whatever you want to say. You can make the numbers and rearrange the numbers to prove that you are right and you are absolutely wrong. But they say numbers don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers don't lie, but the people who come up with the numbers are the liars. Okay. One plus one is still two. It don't lie. But I can twist it. You prove that wrong. It's just wrong. I just feel they wrong. That won't work. <laughs> so there's a lot of manipulation that goes on in the Christian circles because of you. But you have the, the Holy Spirit who will teach you and guide you into what is true. You have human teachers who are teaching under the leading of the Spirit who will guide you into what is true. And the Holy Spirit will say, they're right. They're wrong. That's part of his role in your life. God protects his children. But sometimes, you know, children don't want to be protected. The Holy Spirit guides us, and I just said that because I knew it was coming next. The Holy Spirit guides us. Romans 8 14, for as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. People who are the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit will never lead you into error. Mm -hmm. And this is one of our great challenges as pastors. How, many, how is it that so many of our children, spiritual children, and how is it that so many of God's children keep making such unwise decisions? And claim to be led by the Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit led you into helping you understand your need for salvation. He's just not good for daily life issues. You know, because God is not concerned about how you spend his money. Yes, he is. God's not concerned about how you spend his time. Yes, he is. God's not concerned about how you spend your talent, his talents. See, if it doesn't belong to God, then you have to say he's not concerned. But if it belongs to God, he's concerned. Therefore, is he not going to lead you by his word and by his spirit? And how is it we make so many unwise decisions based on human philosophy, human ideology, human feelings? Because God will not compete for your loyalty. God will let his children go down paths that are not supposed to go down. Because they're hard headed. Stiff neck and stubborn. They want a little bit of human wisdom, they want a little bit of God's wisdom, and then they get to decide which one they want to listen to at what time. It's like our kids. I want to listen to what Joe's daddy got to say, and then they're going to listen to my daddy, and then I'll decide which one I like better. 
but I'm eating my daddy's food. I'm living by under my daddy's air conditioning, AC, heat, roof. But I'm comparing what he says with somebody else's daddy whose house I don't live in. And Paul is saying, I birthed you in preaching the gospel to you. And God, by his power and wisdom from the gospel, regenerated you. You were born again. You were delivered from darkness to light. How are you listening to somebody who didn't do all that for you? It's very challenging, Pastor. And then as we looked at earlier, before some of you came, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, and I betrothed you to Christ because I'm your father, spiritually. And the father determined who the child was going to marry. And Paul says, I have betrothed you to Christ. I didn't betroth you to these other people y'all listening to. And I betrothed you as a chaste virgin, and all they're trying to do is contaminate you and use you. And you're listening to them. You're in danger of listening to them. And I'm just trying to protect you, he says, as a good father should. But like our kids, physically, we think we're more spiritually grown than we are. And that was a problem that correct. Because they weren't using the right standards to evaluate maturity. That happens today. The verb led, found in Romans 8.14, probably means manager as well as showing the way. So if God wants to help you manage your life, because we're what? Stewards. But he also wants to show you the path and the way to go. God gave you resources, and we talked about those, to manage on his behalf. And he wants to give you the wisdom of how to manage those, those gifts, those talents, those abilities, those to that time, those treasures, that temple. So the Holy Spirit leads us in that, according to the word of God. And you can't get that by osmosis. You got to be in the Word of God. You got to memorize it. You got to meditate on it. You got to eat it daily. You got to obey it. You got to apply it. You got to abide it. He renews our mind. He renews our mind in order that we may recognize and approve God's will for us. We do know even if you are born again, you don't think like God thinks naturally. Your mind must be renewed daily, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. So he, the Holy Spirit, renews our mind in order that we may recognize and approve God's will for us so that we'll like what God says and we'll want to do what God says. Because we don't always like what God says. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to change your mind. <laughs> so now that you, what you used to reject, you now approve of. So I read the section in the introduction about how Eastern marriages and Eastern households were done and that the father would let everything and that whatever he believed and whatever he went, that's how it happened. And your mind is saying, that's not America. The spirit is saying, yeah, that's why we want to renew your mind. Because you're not thinking like this. Well, that, that just sounds old-fashioned. Why is it not biblical? That sounds too controlled. Why he get all that control? And if you're saying that about your physical daddy, I know what you're saying about your spiritual. Why he get all that control? Your mind has to 
has been renewed. Because we're not always thinking in line with God's will. And our flesh has no desire for God's will. But the new man hungers and thirsts after God's will. Okay. Romans 12, 2 deals with that. Ephesians 5, 10. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world. And we're not talking about the physical planet. We're talking about this system, this way of thinking that leaves God out. It's a system. It's a worldview that leaves God out. So we're not to be conformed to that. Okay? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you prove it by what? Submitting to it. You don't prove by saying, that sounds good. You didn't prove by because you said, amen. I said amen. Did you do it? Right. Yeah. We amen a lot of stuff we don't do, don't we? Yeah. We amen because, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to amen. This is the amen moment. <laughs> but I ain't doing it. I don't leave with the intention of having my mindset change, renewed. So now I want to prove out that truth I just heard from God. I want to prove that God's will is better than my will. I want to prove that God's will is better than my mom and daddy's will. I want to prove that God's will is better than any of the worst thing the world got done. The only way to prove that is what? To live by it. Ephesians 5 10 says, find out what is acceptable to the Lord. You need to find out what's up to the Lord. How we know it's acceptable to the Lord? He wrote it down. He wrote it down. There is no area of life that God did not write to show you what he approved of. There's nothing you can come up with, either in principle or directly, that God has not told you what his will is on that. We just don't know what we should know. Amen. So now when we got to make the decisions, we can't make the decision to approve of God's will because we don't know what God's will is. Amen. So now, we're rolling dice. <laughs> Spinning the wheel. <laughs> Russian roulette. <laughs> Hoping this is what God wants. When you can know what God wants. Okay. Isn't it true you don't even know what you're going to have to die? Yep. Yeah, that's the truth. Right? But isn't it amazing you can know exactly what God wants? Because he told you. Yeah. He's got all kinds of examples in the Bible who did it right, who did it wrong. How do we claim we don't know? And some of us, as quiet as it, don't want to know. Because if we know, then you got to do. Because if I don't do, I'm being disobedient. So, so that I don't be disobedient, I'm going to try not to know. That's what they say. The Bible says ignorant will not be an excuse. Right. Because God would say, if you could have known and you didn't know, you weren't ignorant. You intentionally didn't find out. Ignorant will not be an excuse. It is not bliss. There's not an ignorant person in hell right now, and there ain't no bliss. Everybody knows God is real in hell right now. They didn't believe on this side. Guess what? Isn't that what the parable of the rich man and Lazarus proved? He didn't believe the whole time he was on this side, but when he got on that side, 
Send somebody like that to talk to my family so they don't have to come here. Mm, they got to get the same way you were supposed to get it on that side. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> Too late. Too late. You could have known. We know a lot of stuff that's not going to do us any good in eternity. Amen. Filling our head with a lot of stuff that means nothing about nothing. Because it's all temporary. But we know nothing about, we don't know as much as we should know about that which is eternal. That will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. Because we live for the temporary, we don't live for the eternal. And that's the great deception of Satan. All there is is now. Be in the moment. Don't think about tomorrow. Now the Bible says don't take tomorrow for granted. But you ought to be thinking about tomorrow. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Store for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust. It's talking about tomorrow. Okay, it's talking about an internal investment portfolio. What does your eternal investment portfolio look like? Is the stock up or is the stock down? Is it a bull market or is it a crash? Do you even review your portfolio? One of my jobs is your spiritual advisor to cause you to think about your portfolio. I'm just going to roll dice on that one. Spin the wheel. Brush the wheel. I'll worry about that when I see Jesus. Ephesians 5, 17, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 22, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. The Holy Spirit leads by various means. What are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit leads? He uses the scriptures, which by their commands, guiding principles, and examples indicate what is God's will for us. So where do you find God's will at? In the scripture. So how many of us, before we make decisions, go to the Bible first? And then do you know where to go in the Bible for the decision you're trying to make? I don't know all the Bible. You have the anointing of one who does know all the Bible. You have spiritual leaders that should have a pretty good grasp on the Bible. But you should have a good grasp on the Bible for yourself because we're not always with you. Okay? So he uses the scriptures which by their commands and guiding principles and examples indicate what God's will is for us. Psalms 119, 11 deals with this. He says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I love what Spurgeon said. When they do my autopsy, I want to be so filled with scripture when they cut me open, blood and scripture come out. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of thinking. If they cut us open, what would come out besides blood? What are we really feel for? What's really hidden in our hearts? Psalms 105.2, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. We were talking about this in my class last night because we were talking about worship and uh, uh, the importance of, of rehearsing back to God his character and his attributes. And, and, and they were amazed when I told them that sometimes we practice on Wednesday night reading the scripture and just praying the scripture. 
It was like I was from another planet. Where, where would you get that from? You get it from the scriptures. They were shocked by the fact that I told them on Wednesday night that that before we start the Bible study, because they're always asking questions how we do things, before we start, we review Sunday's message. What? How you know they heard anything if you don't ask? How do you know the Holy Spirit said anything to them if you don't ask? What did you hear and how are you going to apply what you hear? We just preach sermons and don't ever come back to them. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus preached a sermon and then the disciples, the multitude went away. The disciples went over the corner and they had, what do you mean by what you said? Or he would further explain. I told him. I'm not brilliant. I just read my Bible. I don't come up with this stuff. It's in the Bible. Why would we not review the script, the sermon from Sunday? Why would we not ask the people what they heard, what they're going to do, and what they're doing with it? Mm -hmm. Jesus did. You, you're just so wonderful that you just assume everybody got it. Knowing you know they weren't paying attention. You saw people playing on the phone. You saw them wrestling with the kids. Take them back. That's a good idea. It's in the Bible. See, we read, but what are we really learning from Jesus and Paul, Paul and Peter? In the methodology of how they do it. You don't have to be great. You just have to be observant. Yeah. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, and we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He guides us through our circumstances, including people and events. Wait a minute. So I back up one. He leads us by inward impressions or urges. Now you got to be careful with that. See, that only works well if you're filled with the Spirit. If you're not filled with the Spirit, be careful about listening to your inward impressions and urges. Okay? But he does lead us. As we are filled with his word and with the Spirit, by inward oppressions and urges. There are warning bells that shall go off inwardly. There are uh, bells that, that, that should rally you inwardly. There are, there are bells that should say it's okay to make that step inwardly. If you are filled with the Spirit and you are filled with His Word. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 30, 21 puts it this way. He says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whatever you turn to the right hand or whatever you turn to the left hand, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. The Spirit will warn you about things. The Word of God will warn you about things. Do we listen? And sometimes it's a quiet whisper. Sometimes it's a scream. And that's why you don't want to grieve the Spirit. Because He could scream and you not hear Him because you have seared your conscience. But we listen to people talking loud, saying nothing all the time. I don't know why y'all watch the 10 o'clock news so much. I don't understand. They ain't saying nothing. I don't watch the news. I don't watch the news. Very rarely do I even turn into the news. The weatherman ain't even right all the time. Nope. So why would I want to listen to all that depressing stuff? Why would I want to listen to man-made solutions? They ain't giving me no Bible. They're not giving me any righteousness. They ain't talking about nothing holy. It's all human wisdom. 
It's life under the sun from a human perspective. I don't need that. Mass murder. We don't know why people are doing all these mass murder. Let me do the news. <laughs> that dude, that woman killed all those people because they're full of sin, wickedness, and they're dead in their sins and trespasses. And that's all they can produce. New section over. Bible gets to the heart of the matter quickly. Luke two twenty seven. I can do. I got better stuff to do with my time than watch the news. I rather go get God's perspective on the news. I know it's not global warming. God controls the weather. It's not global warming. It's God controlling the weather. He tells the wind where to go. He tells the rain when to fall. He tells the icebergs when to melt. He tells the oceans where to stop at the, at the crest of the, of the seashore. He controls all that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to listen to you spout global warming and all the science of global warming that's not even true. Mm -hmm. And if it is true, it's because God using global warming to accomplish his will. So the spirit doesn't urge me or impress me to listen to the news. No. <laughs> I already know the answers. They trying to figure it out. So spend time with God. He'll tell you about the news. From his perspective. Okay. Luke 2 27 says, so he came by the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the Christ child to do for him according to the custom of the law. Impressions and urges. But God can lead you that way, but be careful. Mm -hmm. Always sift it through the scriptures first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always seek wise counsel. Okay. Then see, now, he guides us through our circumstances, including people. And this is all throughout the scripture. Acts 11, 24, 26, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to see Paul, Saul, sorry. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. God uses people in your life. But you gotta make sure they're the right kind of people. Okay. And he can guide us through circumstances and situations, including people. The writer of Proverbs says there is wisdom in the counsel of many. You just got to make sure you got wise counselors. And if you're really discerning, even a fool can give you wise counsel if you know not to listen to a fool. <laughs> Sometimes it's wise to do the opposite that the fool is saying. Because he's giving you foolishness, and to do the opposite would be wise. This is all through Proverbs. <coughs> I learned as a kid growing up, I learned when my other siblings were acting foolish, that's probably not something I want to do. Because I see what they got as a result of what they did. So their foolishness helped me to be wise. Because I didn't want no spanking. So I figured very quickly, don't do that and you won't get what they got. Do just the So when mom said, get in the car, and don't let me have to tell you three times. Don't let her have to tell you three times. <laughs> My mom, you know, my mom's, both my mom and dad they are in this nostalgic time in her life. They're all talking about when we were kids. And uh, my mom said, we never had to come chase y'all out the house to get in the car for church. Because y'all knew better. 
If we say we leave at 8 o'clock, y'all was all lined up the clock, uh, by the car at 7.55. Because if she had to come get you, <laughs> Sunday morning meant nothing about a switch. It's Sunday. We don't work on Sunday. <laughs> We'd be out there by the car. Because that's what mom and dad said. It only took one time for us to see somebody else get a whooping. Guess what? I think we ought to be out by. Y'all running through the house, pulling your hair out. Got your makeup running all down your face because the kids won't get out in the car and won't go outside. When you're going to church all frustrated, exacerbated, irritated, can't, can't focus, can't concentrate, can't get in the spirit. Mm -hmm. One time, when I was a kid, that's all it took. Acts 17, 13, 14. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowd. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both sides of Timothy remained there. God used people to protect Paul at certain times. He guides us through our circumstances, including using people and events. Galatians 4.13 You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Acts 13, 14. But when they departed from per Perga, they came to Antioch at Pisidia and went into to the synagogue on a Sabbath day and sat down. God can lead his people through circumstances, situations, other people, and events. But you must validate everything according to the word of God. Any questions? So we've talked about the sufficiency of the spirit. We've talked about how the spirit